Next up, we have Fiona Tria. Tria. Don't worry about it. From <laughs> Intel to talk about uh, Intel's Quick Assist hardware. Um, and also Mark Chambers. And I'll turn it over to Fiona so she can get started. Okay. okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, as John said, my name is Fiona Traha from I'm working with Intel on device drivers for some quick assist technology. And um, here to explain about that technology today and to explain where you can use that in DPDK and what the different software mechanisms are for getting our, our in FreeBSD and the different software mechanisms we have for getting, getting the uh, services from this uh, technology. Um, and Sorry, yes? can you speak up a bit more? Yeah, I'll, I'll try, <laughs> and hopefully we'll get a microphone soon. Um, okay, um, just before I start, because it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to follow the last presentation, I found that really good, so very entertaining. Um, so instead of uh, trying to be entertaining, I'm going to ask Mark, because he has a survey he wants you to fill in, and he has some gifts, so maybe we'll buy you instead. <laughs> yeah. Just really quick, yeah, so uh, I'm the marketing guy for Quick Assist, and uh, I did hand out the surveys. If, please raise your hand if you didn't receive one, and I can hand one out. We do have three gifts. Uh, third prize is a little Intel notebook. Second prize is a rechargeable thingamajig for your phone, and the grand prize is a 240 gig SSD drive, Intel drive. So if you guys fill out the survey at the end of... Uh, Fiona's talk, it just bring you down here to the end and we can just have a quick drawing um, and then we can handle the prizes. Do we have a limit of number of submissions to win? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one submission, good question. <laughs> so raise a hand if you don't have a survey and I can give it to you throughout the talk. Okay, okay thanks Mark. Okay. Pass all the legal stuff. All right, so as I said, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, quick assist technology. This is some silicon technology for cryptography and compression, which Intel has developed. And we've been developing it over a number of, of years, um, and it's, it's recently mature, and there's a whole roadmap of future developments as well. Um, but first of all, there's three parts to the talk. The first is our, our standard suite of Intel drivers, um, and where we've, uh, the, the technology itself and the Intel drivers that we have been using. The second part is our experiences in porting that to FreeBSD, which we've been doing recently. And the third part is a, a different software technology called D DPDK, which is Data Plane Development Kit. Um, and you can also use uh, a DPDK to get access to the cryptography services from the Intel Quick Assist uh, technology. Um, okay. okay, so first of all, the technology itself. Um, so the technology is it's for accelerating services. So the main um, the main area it's trying to address is uh, anything that's computer intensive, and specifically cryptography um, and compression. Um, cryptography, there's both public key cryptography, the, the top line here, which is my pointer, I guess. Uh, is that clear? It seems a little fuzzy to me. Can you see that okay? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the bulk cryptography is symmetric cryptography, um, <coughs> high speed. Um, encryption and decryption of data. Uh, then there's public key cryptography, which is for asymmetric encryption, um, typically used for, for key exchange or... Uh, th so this particular public key cryptography is very heavily maps intensive, the, the algorithms that are used, and so it takes an awful lot of CPU cycles to do this on the CPU. Uh, the third part is compression, um, and yeah, we do, we can we can compress. Again, all of these technologies are things you could do on a CPU, but to do them on a CPU is going to take an awful lot of cycles, and you want to keep your core free for the core free for other uh, services for whatever layers you're loading on top of that. You can offload these uh, these uh, services to the hardware. Um, okay, so the technology comes in various form factors. Uh, we have uh, chipsets. This is kind of the standard method, so I guess we work with most of the time. So it's a, a companion chip to the processor. 
sits on your board and can be accessed across the PCI bus. Um, and there are a number of different speeds of this. Uh, you can also get it as on a plug-in charge. You can buy a, a plug-in charge um, and plug it into any available PCI bus slot on your, on your motherboard. Um, and we've also got system on chip, uh, sim, yeah, on, on chip versions of this. So in that you can, uh, it's it's typically a lower skew, so maybe less informed or less uh, less fewer services. Um, but it's it's embedded on the same package uh, with the processor, um, and it pairs with the Atom chip with the Atom processor. Um, and so we've had several gen. We're on our third generation of this silicon already. Um, so it's it's relatively mature technology, and for each generation we've. Improve the throughput, um, you know, improve the drivers to reduce the cycle count, uh, things like that. And we have a whole, you know, series of, of next generation products in the pipeline as well. Okay, so some of the potential applications for this, I'm not going to go through them all. I could be here all day, and anyway, I don't know a lot about some of these things. Um, you know, but but cloud services, uh, I guess it's fairly obvious to everyone these days that there's an awful lot of, of services being moved to the cloud, and that brings it with itself some headaches, particularly around security areas um, and compression. So for you know to keep everything secure on the internet, you want to have um, encrypt there's a lot of encryption decryption going on. And to have smaller amounts of data to transfer around the network, compression is obviously a big help there. Um, so networking, I'm just going to call out this wireless infrastructure. So uh, in the chip, we handle as well as the standard algorithms that you can um, use for IPsec encryption or SSL encryption, we also have the standard algorithms used for wireless, um, for, for base stations and uh, those kind of services. So we use, we, we have Kazumi and Snow 3G supported. Um, big data, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of big data um, process going on these days. So Hadoop is one area that we've integrated our drivers with um, to do compression. And, yeah, storage, there's, there's various ways that in the storage area you can compress, that it's helpful to compress the data. That's in fact one of our latest features, and it allows you to compress multiple files all with just one offload to the, to the device. Um, and in the device then you can have, uh, you can compress all of this into one big output file, but then you can select out the bits you want to decompress afterwards, so you don't have to decompress the whole, the whole, uh, the whole buffer. You can actually select out the parts you want. So that could be handy for compressing a whole directory structure on a disk, for example. Okay, so a little bit more detail about the actual technology itself and what it supports. So I've already covered so the, the top line there. It's, that it's, it's accelerating things that are computer intensive that could be done on the CPU, but are instead done uh, offloaded to this device. Um, this is the algorithms that we support. Uh, oh, sorry, back again. Um, so we have all the standard ciphers, uh, AES, triple DES, DES, not so much used anymore, or RC4, and then Kazumi and Snow 3G are the wireless algorithms. <coughs> and then for um, hashing, we have all the standard hash algorithms, SHA, SHA1, SHA, all, the, all the different SHA numbers, SHA256, <laughs> everybody can multiply by two, I think. Um, MD5, and then we have authenticated uh, hashing as well, so SHA1. Uh, combined with HMAC um, and AES XCBC. Um, yeah, you can also do those things individually, so cipher only, or you could do hash only, um, but you can also combine them together in a chaining operation where you'll do encryption and then uh, hashing, uh, on the encryption, hashing the output. Um, yeah, for public key, public key cryptography, we do um, yeah, key establishment, asymmetric encryption, the digital signature key exchange. You can also call on those APIs just to do the basic max function, so if you want to do a, um, ex, uh, modular exponent, exponentiation and do the rest of the RSA software yourself, you could call on that function and just do the maths part, on the, just offer the maths part. The privilege to support are um, yes, yeah, compression, decompression. Um, I'll talk a little bit about static and dynamic. So, static compression you compress, you get a, a specific compression ratio, reduce your data by a certain size. With dynamic compression, you can use Hoffman encoding, and it's uh, you go through a second cycle after the compression to, um, to uh, compress 
uh, to get a better compression ratio. So for example, the standard Calgary corpus that a lot of compression ratios and uh, benchmarking is done against, um, it, it improves it by about 10%. Um, I think it's more than 10%. It goes from 48% down to 38%. That's a, a bigger ratio of the overall uh, original data size. Um, <laughs> But the penalty for that if you do dynamic compression is that it takes longer to do the compression. So if latency is a problem for you, you might not want to get the maximum compression ratio. Um, and the algorithms is deflate algorithm, which is LZ77 with Hoffman encoding and G over Z lib. And there's some configurability there in what you what kind of compression you want to do. Um, and we've got stateful and stateless compression and decompression as well. Um, generally we recommend that people use stateless, but you can use stateful. And with stateful, the main point is you have a sequence of buffers that you want to compress. And instead of each one being independently compressed and getting an independent output, you might, uh, if you do stateful compression, you will match patterns that you've seen in the first buffer, can be used in compressing the second buffer, and then onwards to the next buffer, so that you can get a better compression ratio. Are we going to get some audio? Maybe we are. Okay, so I'm not sure where that is. It's just connected to the mic. Okay, can everybody hear me okay, by the way? Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, I said the benefit of stateful compression is that you can get a better and better pattern matching and therefore a better compression ratio. But there is a lot of overhead because you have to maintain an awful lot of history <coughs> information, and that history information and the searching of that takes time, so you can uh, reduce your throughput. So generally speaking, there's not actually a big enough advantage to use it a lot. So stateless is usually the better way to go. Okay, so where do we support this uh, kind of operating systems? FreeBSD? <laughs> not quite yet. <laughs> it's new. Um, yeah, so FreeBSD we've been porting for the last while with some customers. Uh, we haven't pushed anything yet, but hopefully we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, uh, Linux has been our main uh, drivers, the main drivers have been on Linux, um, all the different flavors of that. Um, and then, yeah, other, there's various other things that I can't mention what they are, I'm not sure why they're on the slide, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I inherited the slide. So, uh, but yeah, we work, we have, we can run the drivers in containers, we've run them um, in, we've got a driver now in the, uh, uh, in the Linux kernel, so we have pushed to the kernel. Yes, let's try that. I'm not going to shout quite so much. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> okay, I'll make life a little, little, little bit easier, I think. Okay, so um, where was I? Yeah, so we had traditionally had a driver you could download from a site called 01.org which is where Intel puts uh, software that we want to release. And the source code is there, and you, you can download it and build the software. And that's, that's available for anyone to, to get. Um, but we've also recently moved to a different model where we've pushed our code into kernel.org. So we have a driver in kernel.org, just a, a kernel space driver. Uh, the, other, the driver is still available on zero.org, so that you have the user space libraries you need to go with that. Um, okay, yeah, we can run in a virtual environment, hypervisors, uh, KVM. We are working with other hypervisors that I can't mention right now. And <laughs> <laughs> moving on swiftly, um, we work with OpenStack, uh, Zlib, and we've also got, in, for compression, uh, we can also use Linux kernel crypto framework. I think the name isn't great there, but it is also, they've got a, a compression API in uh, KCA. Okay, uh, so different applications that use this technology so far. Um, we've worked it with, integrated into most, into most of these. Um, Nginx, uh, Quadsip, a few that are right here. And DPDK, which I'm gonna talk about in a little while. Uh, Hadoop I've already mentioned. Uh, database support has been integrated with MySQL and um, RocksDB. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go into a little more bit of detail of the actual hardware and what it looks like and just what the flow is of messages in and out of the chip, just to have a better understanding of that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so there's four different services we provide. I've mentioned three of them already, and I'm only mentioning this one because somebody might be aware of it already and wonder why I haven't mentioned it, and actually it's because we're discontinuing it. <laughs> so it's in the current model of chip, but it won't be in future generations. 
And um, so it's public key cryptography, symmetric cryptography, and data compression are the main services. And down on the chip, the way this works is that we have uh, things called engines, and there's hardware, um, things we call slices or accelerators, and they can do the actual math, the, the, uh, the cipher or, or hashing. Um, to run those, you need to download some firmware. Um, and the firmware is, is downloaded into, the, into an engine on the chip and runs in, in threads within the chip. So it's not taking cycles from your <coughs> CPU. Um, and the way, that, the way that this ends up being high speed, I guess, you're using, up, you're using your cycles across your, DM, your PCI bus and you're DMAing your data in and out from DRAM into the chip and then back out when it's encrypted or compressed. Um, and because that's linked in with the Intel DDIO technology, as well as being in and out of DRAM, it's also, it will also be stored in the last level cache. So if you need it from the CPU, it, it will be cached as well. Okay, I'm gonna expand this a little bit because it's probably easier to talk to it. This is just showing the flow through the chip of a request when you want to do, and I'm gonna talk about it as, say, encryption. Okay. Okay, so there's a sequence of things that happen, and, and the reason that, you probably don't need to know all this detail, but the reason I'm pointing it out is just to see the kind of flow of where the data is, and that the data itself doesn't have to get copied by your software that's running on the CPU. Um, so you've got three parts. This is a DRAM, where the data is that you want to encrypt. You've got the CPU, and then you've got our quick assist technology on a, a chipset. Um, and the data is in DRAM, and we also have, okay, something, so the, the way we get data into the chip is through something we call, and I, I'm gonna, there's several different technology or terminology mentioned on the slides, so I just wanna talk about it a little bit first. Um, we have channels to get the data in and out of this chip. Um, and those channels are sometimes referred to as rings, queues, queue pairs, depending on which slide you're on or who you're talking to. Um, I'm gonna just call them channels for the moment, and hopefully I'll try and stick to that terminology for the rest. Um, and those channels are in DRAM. So what, there's a, 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 essentially a circular buffer set up in DRAM, and you put your, you put your uh, request into that, and it points to where your data is that you want to encrypt. And then that request, so if I'm off to the flow now, it might make a bit more sense. So you create your, you have, if you have data being encrypted, it's in DRAM already, you create, you create a request in DRAM on one of these channels, on the circular buffer. And then the second thing you do is you just write to a register on the PCI endpoint of the chip, and that's just a trigger to tell the chip that it's available. So there's very little MMIO that needs to go on, because MMIO cycles are expensive for the CPU, and really DRAM writes are much cheaper. So most of your work is done in setting up things in DRAM, and then you just write to a CSR. That triggers the PCI endpoint to go and, there's three contents over here. It loads the data from there by a DMA down into the chip. And it's compressed then on the hardware, um, I mean not compressed, encryption I'm talking about, okay. So it's encrypted down the hardware, and when it's finished, it writes back out, so number five is here. It writes the data back out again with DMA out to DRAM. And the chip doesn't you know, trigger the CPU to say the data's ready, so the software run on your CPU is polling, uh, or six, yeah. It's gonna poll the data's registered here to see when is their data ready. And once it's ready, then you can go and read the data out of DRAM. So you read the data from DRAM into your core and you do your processing. So I suppose the point of this is just to, say, to, to show about the flow that most of your work is done just doing DRAM reads and writes. And then there's very little direct access to the chip. To, there's just one CSR write, one CSR read. And that tends to be amortized over many requests as well. So you may put 10 requests to the chip, but just do one write to save those 10 requests waiting. So that's how we get very high throughput. Um, maybe now's a good time to mention some numbers as well. I don't have them written on slides um, because Mark's the official guy for the numbers. So um, I think, I uh, can't remember the name of the guy who was speaking earlier, but you mentioned IPsec, four gigabits per second um, in, in software, um, in the application he was talking about. Um, the Galito device can do 45 gigab gigabits per second of IPsec encryption. Um, so it's, it's considerably higher than you're gonna get through your CPU. Um, and for uh, SSL, it would be 50 gigabits per second, and there's 16K buffers. Uh, for compression, you can do 24 gigabits a second um, of compression, and for public encryption, is the other number we like to quote, um, 24, or sorry, 40 kilobytes, uh, 40 kilo ops per second 
a 2K peak size. Sorry. RSA. Yeah, RSA. Yeah, RSA 2K bubbles. 40 kilowatts per second. <coughs> I think it's oh, 90 at 1K. Um, so if you have questions on the numbers afterwards, I don't have them written on slides, but you can ask Mark and we can get you more detailed, specific information. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is just to highlight the virtualization. Um, so I'm going to talk about this first because this is the non-virtualized case. So in the non-virtualized case, actually, maybe I can just make it just a little bit bigger. Yeah. In the non-virtualized case, we have the, the hardware down here and the device. You've got your host operating system. You have a kernel driver. That kernel driver will set up the chip, uh, download the firmware that I mentioned earlier down to the engines, and then your application builds in. If I'm, I'm in, in most of this talk, I'm presuming your application is a user space application. You can also use this in direct access kernel space, but most people, it's, it's user space is where their, their applications are running. So the application in user space builds in a user space, space library, um, and it talks to the kernel space driver just for initialization purposes to figure out what channels to use, how many channels are available to it, um, and the quickest driver in kernel space maps up the register space of the device up into user space so that the user space application can write directly to the chip. And that's the reason I've got this line down here. So for the data path, so when you want to get your high throughput um, in your process, the user space library would be writing straight to the hardware. Um, so it'll write into DRAM as I already showed you to, to create the request there, and then it'll write the register directly itself. So there's on the data path, on the data plane there is no offloading of, uh, there's no transfer of control from the user space library to the kernel driver and then the kernel pass into the chip. It's not done like that, it's, it's direct access to the chip. Okay, and that's the non-virtualized case, virtual case. And in the virtualized case, we have your device down here. And I'm showing it now as lots of devices. Uh, it doesn't say anything there, but there's 32 different devices. And so your quick assist um, physical function uh, is there's a quick assist driver in the kernel, um, and that quick assist driver running on the host on the <coughs> the PF driver, it downloads the firmware and does the enablement it needs to do to, to get the chip up and running on the PCI bus, and then it enables SRIOV, and the SRIOV functionality then exposes essentially 32 different VF devices. So all that means to the user is that instead of seeing one device that has uh, 32 different bundles of six channels each. Instead, it sees 32 different PCI devices, and each one of those has a smaller um, amount of channels available to access the device. Okay, so your host driver has done its work on the kernel. Then if you have guests, you can pass up some of these VFs directly to the guest. So your hypervisor will do that. So your hypervisor uh, enables your guest to use particular PCI devices. And then in your guest, you're going to run a kernel driver a VF driver, that's going to find, same, it's the same as what this does down here, except it has to do a lot less. It doesn't need to download any firmware because that's been done already. All it needs to do is enable the, VF, the channels uh, to the user space library. So it's to set up this interface so that your user space library is the exact same as over here. It runs, it talks to the kernel driver, finds out what channels it can use. This memory maps them up here, and then it can speak directly to the hardware. So even on a VF, Again, you're passing straight through. When it comes to your data path, you're going straight through to the hardware. So again, you can get high throughput by doing that. Um, and there's some comms that can go on across an internal chip uh, path within the device between the two just to make sure that they're compatible with each other. Okay, so that's your virtualized uh, environment. And VTD is enabled in your BIOS to enable the, to the address map mapping from the guest physical address to the host physical address. Um, all the, I, mean, I didn't mention it earlier, but I guess uh, for anyone working in this area, all the data that needs to be transferred in and out to the chips to be encrypted or decrypted has to be in physically addressable memory um, that's set up by, by the application. <coughs> okay, uh, any question on that so far? That's the whole, like, the, that's the technology background, the, what the chip can do. Nope. All right, um, then I'll talk a little bit about the port to FreeBSD. My slides are a bit light in this, so I'm just going to talk to them. <coughs> Sorry, yes. So why, why didn't you make it an HSM? 
Uh, which, sorry? Do <coughs> you make it a hardware security module as well? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> what, 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 would I be, what would we have done differently? Could you, could you? Hardware keys that can be extracted? Storing, storing keys in the hardware that Okay. So we are investigating that for future technology. We have different acronym for it, but um, yeah, that, that, is being <laughs> <laughs> that, that is being addressed in future versions. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. So we've been working on porting to our our Linux drivers to FreeBSD for um, in the 10.x 10.2. Uh, area for the last maybe couple of months, and uh, we're also working on, on. We don't plan to upstream that. Um, we are working on 11.x as well, and based on our Linux driver, and we are hoping to upstream that. I'm not going to give any commitments for the moment, but certainly there is a lot of work going on at the moment. We do have working models. We have a lot of work to do to get to the point that we can push them. Um, but this will be in the FreeBSD um, in, in, in the near future. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the problems, not so much problems, yeah, just the, some of the challenges and the advantages and things that we came across through the port. <coughs> so uh, just a bit of terminology first here because we, we talk about this a good bit. So in tree drivers, I'm not sure if they're commonly, if, you, if everyone understands them the same way. So, so in tree drivers are the drivers uh, that we refer to, the driver that's in our, in kernel.org has been the in tree driver. Um, and I guess the one we'll push to freebsd.org has been the in tree driver. Um, but we also have an out of tree driver. So we've always had an out of tree driver for Linux for the Quick Assist devices, and it's been available through 01.org. And the reason for having that is one reason is mentioned here, but there's several others. It's, it's to provide the extra support to the, the entry driver for the kernel. It uh, doesn't allow you to directly access the chip from user space. So the nice diagram that I showed you earlier, where the user space library in the application was able to write directly to the hardware. Um, the Linux kernel doesn't support that, so instead you get we have a superset of the kernel driver which adds extra direct access uh, functionality, and also has the user space libraries. You need to work with that. Um, so we call that a out of tree driver, and there's several other reasons that we would have that out of tree driver. It's in case we want to add things to the kernel that the kernel doesn't allow us to add, but that some customers specifically want to use, um, or or even early access to features that aren't yet pushed to the kernel. So when we go to FreeBSD, we may have the same model, otherwise my understanding so far is that it's uh, easier to push early models or early versions of code to FreeBSD rather than to, to Linux. So it may be possible that we don't, you know, maybe that we don't need to use the output tree as much, but we use it quite a lot in our Linux uh, environment. Um, okay, so I've mentioned these two. So direct model and indirect direct model. What I was showing you earlier was direct model. It's where you directly access the rings from user space, rings or the channels. And the indirect model is out of the box driver used for kernel for the for Linux kernel. Uh, <coughs> so anyone who wants to access it and if you get the Linux 4.4 kernel right now and you call the standard crypto framework, the Linux crypto framework, um, those APIs they can access our our driver directly. But it's slow. You're not going to get the throughput that we'd like you to get because you're going to have to offload you you prepare your message, prepare your encryption, call the Linux framework with your information, it has to then go and transfer the data into the chip. It won't, it won't let you access the kernel directly, uh, hardware directly. Okay. okay, so some of the advantages, um, some of the things that we saw as we went through this uh, firmware is downloaded differently on FreeBSD. So we had to make quite a lot of, of changes to our existing model. And actually, maybe I'll just back up a little bit and talk a little bit about the, the different repos we had. So we have. Um, multiple Git repos to create our driver. And obviously when we wanted to port to FreeBSD, the last thing we wanted to do is take them all, duplicate everything, rework the code. So you know, it's in our own interest, I guess, in terms of a development team to be able to have as much common code as possible. So we have multiple different repos, maybe six or seven that we draw code from. Um, we have tried to keep that code as much as possible to be OS independent. So significant portions of it, and most of the user space library part is OS independent. And then there are parts that are OS uh, specific. So for the OS specific part, what we've done, we've got two different mechanisms that we do. One, we've got macros where we would replace uh, things like the name of a header file that's a different name in one file to another, or memcopy where you might have a different uh, function. And we have uh, macros in our code. 
So what that means is that our source code can't be compiled straight out of the repos as it is. We have to do a, a pre-compile step. So we run through a pre-compiler, it, it sucks the code out of the different repos, puts them through filters, and then stores them in a, a directory structure, and then from that directory structure, you can then you do your build. And then when it comes to open sourcing, so for kernel.org, from that directory structure is where you're going to diff against your uh, latest on kernel.org and create your patch set. So we're, you know, we have to set up the same model, or we want to set up the same model to work with FreeBSD, so that we can share as much of the code as possible with, uh, with FreeBSD and Linux and any other uh, operating system we work with. Um, but we also have to handle the, the licensing issues that you're all I'm sure, well aware of. Obviously, if somebody pushes an issue, uh, pushes a patch into kernel.org and we think that's a useful patch and we want the FreeBSD driver, we have to be very careful how we go about that. So, um, yeah, that pre-compiled step, you know, we'll, we'll make sure the correct licensing is in place on the files that are going to be uh, pulled into each of the different um, open source projects. Life was a lot simpler before open source, but I guess it's much more interactive now. <laughs> At least it was in our control then. Um, yeah, so, so there are some of the things, I'm trying to think, remember what, there was a few other uh, things that we, there's a, a UIO, um, UIO for accessing user space, between user space and current space, that interface in, um, in Linux. Um, we did a new version of it for FreeBSD that we'll be pushing. Um, yeah, so the firmware has to be registered in FreeBSD and stored in a particular location to be downloaded. Um, and you use some APIs to download that. That's not in Linux, that's done differently. The firmware can be stored at the path of our choosing. Um, let me think about the other things. Uh, yeah, so one of the other, I guess, advantages that we found working with FreeBSD was the, um, the Looser standards, maybe that's not the right way to put this. <laughs> but in terms of process. code, instead of coding standards, <laughs> sorry? I would, I would characterize it as a more flexible yes, process. Yes, definitely a more flexible process. So a lot of our original code is written in camel case. We couldn't push that to kernel.org, we had to rework a lot of the code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some people have done this before around here, I'm thinking. Um, also in Linux, they don't like you to have more than four or five parameters into any function, and we have some humongous functions with you know thirty parameters, things like that. So, um, so we found it much more flexible to work with FreeBSD and faster to get a driver to the point that you can actually use it, and, and hopefully faster that we can push a driver, so we can take a, a significant amount of our original code and push that to, to FreeBSD um, and, and get it running in FreeBSD. That also enables us to use um, our Quick Assist API. So we have a proprietary API called Quick Assist API, which um, you know there's a lot of most of the um, applications I mentioned earlier are coded against that API. Um, but I said in, in the Linux framework you can't use that API because you have to use the Linux kernel crypto framework, um, and we haven't pushed our, our Quick Assist API into that area. But we think with FreeBSD that there may be a um, people might use that Quick Assist API to access the services. Um, and they provide a fairly rich, that API is quite a rich uh, API with, which allows you to specify all the different algorithms and, and all, you know, everything you need, whereas there's a, a much smaller subset of that available to, to the Linux users. Um, I think they're the main things really with our FreeBSD, so it's been an interesting process and we've, you know, we've said we're getting there with the working and at the moment it's, it's running and both are testing. Okay, any questions on the FreeBSD port? Yeah. So the driver is one thing, but did you integrate with the open crypto framework as well? The, there was actually a much earlier version done that did in a, a couple of years ago with an earlier version of our driver, but at the moment, no. <laughs> but what we have, we have got a, a plan. I think what, actually, what our plan is to ask you for your feedback on this. So the Quick Assist API is what we're currently planning to push. From that Quick Assist API, you can shim to OCF, um, and we think that's quite easy to do that and we can help people to do that in, in the shorter term if people need to do that. Can you speak up a bit, Mark? Okay. Does that answer your question? But actually, if you do give feedback though to Mark and myself afterwards, if you think that is something that would be important to you and if you wouldn't want to shim through the quick assist to it, then we can look at putting another one map. You said the Quick API was proprietary. Is it open specification? Yes. So. 
It's just camel case, probably, right? That's yes. the reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Huge malfunction in the So what uh, can we expect once the port is done? Uh, if I would like to use it with OpenSSL, uh, what's neat on the OpenSSL part, especially uh, I'm interested in the async mode, uh, how yes. does it work with FreeBSD? Okay. You should probably repeat so, the question. Oh, sorry, yes. So the question was with OpenSSL, um, the, there's an asynchronous mode that so we've uh, added the OpenSSL. Are you wondering how we can work with the OpenSSL and the asynchronous mode in the FreeBSD area? So first of all, on the asynchronous mode, that's I think it's in OpenSSL 1.1, and we've pushed that so that we could put a, a Linux engine uh, into OpenSSL for, for our driver, um, and you can shim to that. Um, with FreeBSD, I guess if the quickest Assist API is available, once we have that available, that same shim should work to the quickest Assist API on FreeBSD. Um, but I'm not sure, I don't know, Mark, do you know anything more? Are we currently working on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we need to first, and that's exactly what you said, but stuff is Yeah. Was that integrated? Uh, will that work with direct model? Uh, the FreeBSD. Yes. Yes. Because the FreeBSD, we can push the quick system. It gets the direct model that we be able to use. Okay. Uh, you also asked for uh, the questionnaire. You also asked for speeds uh, at 100 gigabits per second and 100,000, 100 uh, k ohms per second. Yes. Why? Sorry, why do we why do we yes. mention? Do you plan to, to provide some devices or ah uh, so Mark is going to put the questionnaire together. We it's it's to know what direction we need to go, I guess, and how far we need to go. Uh, so the question Mark just repeated was why are we asking the questionnaire about hundred kilowatts per second or hundred gigabits per second? Are they is there a reason we're asking those questions? Yeah, it's really just to gauge where the industry is at in terms of their performance targets. <coughs> Can I still use currently, uh, once the driver is done, can I use like two cards to get the, yeah. twice yes. the performance? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. If you have enough PCI bandwidth and have enough memory bandwidth and other things. I Good do. point. So yeah, if you've got I PCI do. bandwidth, we're limited. It's, I think 50 gig per second is basically going to be the limit on the Gen 2 and, and Kalito chip uh, is, is Gen 2. Is your current limitation caused by PCI Express bandwidth? Yes. Yeah. Well. well you know, I think if you remove that, you'd find we've other limitations. But we did target it at that bandwidth, knowing that you know that the PCI was going to limit us there anyway, so we didn't fill that into the hardware more than that. You also didn't mention uh, uh, algorithms that are supported for async crypto. But I guess it's RSA, <coughs> some RSA, curves. DSA, elliptic curve. Uh, I think you have, you have I think I've got a list here somewhere. Yeah. I can, I can let you know after this yeah. anything in particular, but yeah. Oh, sorry, okay, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, which asymmetric algorithms we support? So it's RSA, DSA, Diffie Hellman, um, Elliptic Curve, um, uh, ECDSA. Um, I'm not sure if I've left something out there. So if there's anyone in particular you need, let me know. Yeah. What's your ongoing support model for this? Are you planning to have a committer on staff, or this is like you're going to support it previously from here on out? All yes. A future yes, parity we with Linux? Just not, we don't have a name right at this point that we can give you, but yes, there is a plan to have a committer, and um, yeah, we're working with some people, um, okay. John, but, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to mentor someone, get someone up to speed in that. And then feature parity with Linux? And then feature, yes, that's on the roadmap, feature okay. parity with Linux. Um, I said I can't tell you a time frame right now, but yeah, yeah. definitely that's the roadmap, yeah. yeah. So what, what we do, do have several customers we're working with who are interested, in, so we have a good motivation, I guess, <laughs> to actually do this. Yeah? So when I will be able to try all of this? The port, the openness uh, changes? I don't think I can answer that question right now, sorry. I don't have a schedule that I can actually publish. So um, at the moment, we are talking about the second half of this year, but we'll get something out. But I can't right now give you that. I can't commit to that. Um, 
But I will show you another way in a minute, which you can get access to it, although that's probably not what you want for open access, uh, the 200 PDK, you will be able to get access to it. Yeah? A yeah, uh, couple of questions. Uh, how future proof is it uh, in terms of uh, new algorithms? Um, well, I can't talk about the next gen, but there are, I mean, it's, it's a future proof, it's a, you know, the technology has like several different, <laughs> people going and thinking I'm going to let something slip here. <laughs> There is, um, there, there is a pipeline and there are several different products that are, and, and they add new algorithms to this, whatever we think the industry is looking to use. Okay. They, they do get added. So it's not like we stay with just the set of algorithms and then just make it faster, we are including, increasing the algorithm set as well. Yeah. Well, on, on the compression side, LZW is pretty popular these days. I don't know if you support it. LZW? I'm not, I'm not. So, sorry, the question was, is LZW? Uh, is popular compression algorithm are we planning to support it? Right, uh, so there's been a couple of questions on algorithms. We do have an insert that's going to be going into the, uh, the BSD can. If you're planning to <coughs> tin that in the bag, it's going to be insert with all the algorithms for quicknesses. So just you guys have, have something tangible. We do support LZO today. Um, I can't speak for future generations. It's, I think um, that's probably not the most popular. Uh, another question on the on the user land to kernel side. Uh, have you guys considered uh, NetMap for uh, for music? Has pretty good uh, API for passing uh, buffers uh, directly between kernel or well, map and map, uh, uh, and it's used for the network stack. But it's pretty generic uh, in general. So the question the question just said. Question was that have we considered using NetMap for um, compression on the FreeBSD user land side of things? I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I'm not sure if you do. Uh, I don't think it's been a huge emphasis, but we're we'll taking it into consideration. Maybe we can take a note on that. Well, I think TPT, TPTK is Intel's NetMap. I think it's a way to take it. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but I already have NetMap, so if I can yeah, plug into that. Yeah, but they have PPDK multiple systems from Intel's perspective, I think. That's the way they look at it, right? PPDK on the next system. NetMap. So I was wondering if there was software fallback for algorithms that aren't directly supported by the hardware. So as you go through generations of hardware, can you deploy to one cloud that has a mix? Or is that okay. your responsibility as <laughs> the customer or the application writer? Yeah, so the question was, is there, are there software fallback for algorithms that aren't supposed to be supported in the hardware? Um, so, I mean, this is specifically about what is supported in the hardware, so, but Intel in general has software libraries available for various algorithms, and on GPTK, our strategy is to have, for, for everything that we support in QuickAssist, or we have a, you can, you can uh, code against a standard <laughs> API, and that API we would provide software implementations for anything that we provide a hardware implementation for so that you can use the same software at your application level. Any more questions? Yeah. One more quick follow-up on that. Sure. So for the software fallback, is that also part of the same repository? So if we wanted to provide soft, um, single APIs for people to use that would do software fallback or hardware, can we leverage your code or is that something where we would have to do that? Okay, so if it depends on whether you're going to use the Quick Assist API or whether you want to go to the DPDK route. So for the Quick Assist API, we don't have specific software. We don't have like a software implementation under the Quick Assist API. That is the software implementation of, of that. So you'd have to code it yourself, but the libraries you know, are, are there, I guess, and they can be used. And there's, um, yeah, there's an AS9 multi-buffer library that Intel provides, and there are various other libraries for Snow um, externally available. Um, in DPDK, we do have that model. So if you're programming against the DPDK interface in the future, then there would be a software library provided. Um, but you would have to go and for, for some of those libraries, they're not provided with the same repository or in the same package. You would have to go to other websites to get them. Some of them are. And the licensing That's is license. similar or? Sorry? Is the licensing similar? Um, I know for the wireless ones, it's, it's, it's different. We do a license and user space. space. It's uh, free BSD and user space. And Yeah, so that's for our code, but for example in DPDK, because you're then dependent for the software implementation, you're dependent on libraries that are separate, so we wouldn't be shipping them with our DPDK library. Um, you have to get those separately, and there's information in the release notes that goes with DPDK to say where to get them, and then they may have different license restrictions as well. Um, 
So I know some of the, the, the wireless ones anyway, they do, there is a process you have to go to actually request the library. Um, and that involves knowing where you're from. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, on the, on the hardware side, it seems like these offload engines are similar to the IOAT um, offload engines that exist from Intel. So like they had ones for doing Parity calculations. Um, they have like a copy. I can't remember all the different algorithms. But they're are these are just separate technologies from your perspective, or are they? Yes, they're separate. So I'm I'm personally not familiar with the IOAT technology, so I couldn't okay. say whether they are prepared. But certainly, this technology is has been outside of this, the the CPU has been you know. So I think you're talking about CPU technologies. I think it's part of the memory controller, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's this separate, is a separate, separate, separate family. Completely separate groups born out of two different technologies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll move on just so I can get a chance to talk about TPDK for another time. <laughs> is that okay? Uh, okay, so, um, so just to, to maybe put this in context, so the libraries I've mentioned so far, so the Linux library and the, the FreeBSD library that we're, or library drivers that we're um, planning to push. Um, these give you access to the full suite of compression, public key cryptography, and symmetric crypto. Um, you know, or the plan is that they would do that you know, over time for FreeBSD. Um, and they're downloadable as a full package from 01.org. Um, and they use the Quick Assist API as the API mechanism to get to the, to get to the services. Um, Intel had started, uh, for, particularly for packet processing, um, this is data plane development kit. Data plane development kit. It started off as an Intel set of libraries that were specifically dedicated to high speed uh, um, network processing. So taking packets and shipping them around the network and doing whatever you need to do with them. And in the last year, and so, and so this is a software library. This isn't focused on any particular hardware device. It's not specific to the um, It was specific, I guess, to Intel Ethernet uh, driver, Intel Nix, um, originally. But a couple of years ago, then, they open sourced the DPK library. And it's now there's an open source community. It's no longer an Intel uh, software. It's a, it's a broader software community with many different contributors. Um, and it supports lots of different CPUs, lots of different uh, uh, Ethernet drivers, uh, Ethernet devices that are non-Intel as well. So it's a framework. Um, that provides for a, an API layer that you can use to access. Uh, you can plug in drivers underneath that API layer to support many different devices. And those devices could be either virtual devices where you might uh, run the coded software, or they could be actual hardware devices. So that's the kind of um, the architecture, I guess, of GPDK and, and the evolution of it. And so about a year ago, we thought it would be quite useful. A lot of these packets that come into the, uh, your network card need encryption or decryption services. So we wanted to add another layer to that so that we could access the quick assist cryptography um, through this uh, DPD guy, DPDK model, particularly targeted customers who are already doing their packet processing in DPDK. But I will point out that it's a subset, so it doesn't have, for example, compression. At the moment, it doesn't have public key cryptography, and there's not necessarily a plan to make this full feature compatible. So at the moment, the focus is purely on symmetric crypto. Um, but it's there at the moment, it's open source, you can download it and use it. Okay, so, uh, yeah. and it's, it's user space, uh, libraries. Okay, so I mentioned this, this is the, this is what was there before, there's the Ethernet Dev API, EDEV, um, and underneath that you have what are called pole mode drivers, and below that is the hardware. And so under this API, you can plug in many different uh, pole mode drivers, controlling many different types of hardware. So what we did was we added a crypto dev API, um, which would allow you to access services on Quick Assist. But I said this whole program isn't about uh, the Quick Assist technology, it's actually more about providing uh, a way, a means for, um, for applications to access cryptography service and whether they have, they don't need to change their uh, application layer just because they don't have the hardware available. So it can run whether you've got the hardware available or not. So for everything that we've provided underneath this API, we've provided uh, both software and hardware pole mode drivers. The hardware one is for the quick technology, and the software one is um, leveraging uh, libraries that already exist and the new AES9 instructions on the CPU to give you a high-speed software implementation. So, 
So what we found actually in this model is that the quick assist driver is actually competing with our Intel CPUs because they can do AES quite quickly these days on the CPU as well. It takes cores, we can save them some of those cores, but it takes very few cycles on the CPU as well. So this is what we've done. We've plugged in the quick assist uh, driver and we've plugged in other drivers and she can access the hardware. Um, have I covered everything in that? Yeah, it's just Metro Crypto at the moment. It's just targeted on IPsec. Um, and Oh, sorry, and wireless, actually, we've covered, we've got Snow 2G uh, algorithm in there as well, and we're planning to upstream Kazumi shortly. Um, okay, oh, uh, yeah, and, and this whole area, this is all, uh, this is user space drivers only. So it's still dependent on having a quick, a quick assist kernel driver that runs in the kernel, downloads that firmware I mentioned earlier, sets up the channels that the user space interface is going to use. Okay, and in future we could add new acceleration device types, um, like compression or whatever. Right now they're not connecting on the roadmap. Okay. Uh, sorry, one more point here. It uses, as I said, the stock kernel driver, but it also um, uses the SRIOV technology. So we don't expose up our single physical function device up to the user space. We expose the 32 individual virtual functions instead up to user space. And they're picked up by DPDK. And in DPDK, you can uh, you can get direct access to the hardware. Um, they have uh, I think it's a magic mechanism to their UIO of accessing the hardware directly uh, and bypassing the the uh, limitations that the Linux kernel puts on allowing user space to access the hardware. Okay, so okay, right. Um, okay, so I've mentioned this already. I think this is uh, how we expose the devices that we have. Uh, we have our, our device and we've got our, our uh, VF drivers and there's 32 of them um, and we pass them up to the uh, to the driver that sits in IBM. Uh, the current driver is what sets them up. It's covered everything there already. Okay, so the set of APIs that we added, I'm not going to show you the particular here, but you can look at them if you go to dpdk.org, you can download them. Um, there are crypto device management, find the device, discover the device, start the device. Uh, you can collect stats and capabilities. Capabilities is quite important in the DPDK area because you have this layer, the CryptoDev API, and below that uh, there are different drivers. But some of those drivers are drivers for devices that may not support all of the features. So, for example, right now we only support uh, AES, plus SHA, various SHAs, plus HMAC. We don't support uh, DES yet, for example, or triple DES. So, you know, you can query the capabilities to find out. And there would be software Homo drivers that will only support AES, and we have separate drivers that only support uh, AES GMAC, um, and a separate driver that supports Snow 3G. So drivers can be really um, focused on one particular target area, and you have Homo driver that just does one thing. So if you use capabilities infrastructure, you can find out whether your algorithm is covered or not. It does a symmetric hash and cipher. Um, session management and operation management. Yeah, so I didn't mention this earlier, but I guess if you're doing cryptography, generally speaking, you set up a session, and in that session, you're going to have a lot of things common for every request. So you're always going to use the same encryption algorithm, the same key. So if you set, you don't want to send that in every request down to the hardware, so you set up a session, um, and the software stores that information and pre-prepares as much of the request as possible. So that for each operation that you want to encrypt, you can, you've got a pre-prepared instruction already uh, instead of wasting cycles on the software. Um, and burst API, so to act, the way we actually send the request to the hardware in DPDK is by using a burst mechanism. So it's uh, very much about grouping you know, 20 encryption requests together and sending them on the burst together. Um, there is a on the quickest API, we have focused on individual requests to encrypt like one buffer or decrypt one buffer or one SGL, a scatter gather list. Um, so in DPDK, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, amortizing of cycles by grouping things in first. So you're using the data plane API? Uh, sorry, in the quick assist API? The, the no, we actually have, an, it's a new API, but yeah. New it, API. Yes, exactly. So the data plane API in the quick assist API that's on 01.org in our, in our standard Linux driver, and will be in FreeBSD, that has a, a burst API as well, and that's the data plane API. Um, how many sessions can you handle? On DPDK, it's unlimited. It's whatever amount of memory you want to use. You know, there's no necessary amount of memory you need. One DPDK. 
Sorry? So it's only within the PDK. Sorry, the question, by the way, was how many sessions can you use? Can you, is there a limitation? Um, in, yes, so just within DPDK, you set up a session, a buffer of memory that you want to use for sessions, and you say how many sessions you want to, you know, so it's down how much memory you want to dedicate to that, and then you can set the sessions separately to your device. They're independent. They can then, the same session could be used. Uh, actually, they're per device type. So you need a different type of session set up for you go to software or hardware, because the, pr the preparation that gets done is different for each one. Um, since there's food ready, I might just keep moving on. Um, is that okay? Uh, you're probably getting hungry. <laughs> um, and this is, I think, the last slide anyway. <coughs> what I wanted to get to is to where you could try this out in FreeBSD. So you may remember earlier I talked about this. Um, <coughs> okay. Earlier I talked about a virtual system. Right now we don't have a FreeBSD kernel driver that we can give you. But we did set up this about two weeks ago back in China. Um, this is a, a, a Linux kernel on the host and FreeBSD on two guests. And so we have a Linux driver that can run on the host, download the firmware, set up the channels you need, and export the VFs uh, up to guests. So this is standard <coughs> Linux. Your Quixis driver has done the download of the firmware and has exported your drivers, uh, your devices. The difference on your guests is that where before you need to have um, a Linux Quickassist driver here, which on your guest started up, had to communicate with the Quickassist driver and enable the channels up to the user space. So it had to memory map the registers up into user space so that the application in user space could actually talk directly to the hardware. In, DPK, in DPDK, they have uh, kernel drivers called, it's a generic kernel driver, the NICUIO driver, is what it's called on FreeBSD, this is specifically for FreeBSD, it's called IGB UIO on Linux. Um, and there's also VFIO, the standard Linux driver. Um, you can run that on your guest, on your guest kernel, and that discovers the PCI device um, and enables that to be available in user space. So your user space application starts up and gets access to the device, and as I said, this hasn't done anything quick as specific at all. Um, this is just <coughs> user space, this is just seen as a standard PCI device, and your user space your DPDK library can, can go straight to the hardware. So it's a simpler model. Um, there's maybe a little bit less protection. These don't talk to each other to make sure that they're, you know, that, that this one and this one are, well, it, this could be using the VF and this could be using the VF and they wouldn't necessarily know. I mean, you have to set up your system correctly. There's more protection, I guess, in the other system where the two current drivers talk to each other, but it works. It works perfectly well and right now we can run uh, an application, the IPsec sample app that I showed you on the previous one, we can run that on a free BSD guest using the DPDK uh, crypto dev API, and that will give you access to the quick access device directly. Okay, I hope I haven't confused you too much. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions on the DPDK part of things? Yes? <laughs> I think it's lunch time. <laughs> uh, I don't think I, I don't think I have an answer to that right now. <laughs> um, I think it's something useful that I can add to that. Yeah. So yeah, no, I don't have anything useful to add to that at the moment. Um, but I mean, SRIV gives you. Um, gives you security on accessing the VFs. The VFs are passed through to your guest, and your guest has secure access to that one VF, so there can't be any attack across that. Um, okay. okay, sorry, that's probably not the answer you wanted. <laughs> we can talk a lot afterwards. Yes? Uh, does it run on non Intel CPUs? Does it run on Intel CPUs? It runs on any, on any CPUs, uh, yeah. on any x86 CPUs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was the question, does it run on non Intel? Yeah, non Intel. Sorry. Non yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it runs, DPK will run on any CPU, on any OS, maybe not any OS, but certainly lots of OSs. Right. Um, it's broadly OS independent, OS agnostic in user space. Uh, I think Max's question is if, if you happen to have like an ARM 64 bit server yes. and you buy the PCI clock card, you stick it in there, will that work? Yes. And yes, the, 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 it actually will work. It will work. The, the yes. Kaliso chips, the, the chipset, the, um, they, they are standard PCI Express devices. Mm -hmm. They can run against any CPU. 
We should get more advantage if you use an Intel one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay, then thanks for your time, everybody. Yeah, I want to do this really quick. Yeah, Mark, so, uh, just by way of reminder, what the survey, if you still want to participate and you haven't filled it out, go ahead and fill it out. I'm sure you guys are going to line up for lunch, so maybe I'll just grab it here. Uh, we can do the drawing while you guys are eating, and then uh, 